Did you know that in the year 2000, something groundbreaking happened in the world of biker clubs right here in Ontario, Canada? What if I told you that the national president of the Canadian Hells Angels made a never-before-seen offer to several Ontario biker clubs? It was an offer that would allow them to join the Hells Angels, with patches equivalent to what they already had. Imagine the shockwaves this sent through the biker community. Many members of the Paradise Riders accepted this offer, but what followed would change the course of their lives forever. Let's dive into this captivating tale of loyalty, betrayal, and the unexpected twists that led one man, David Atwell, to become a government informant. Let's begin. The inclusion of 168 bikers from various Ontario biker clubs, including Satan's Choice, The Vagabonds, The Lobos, The Last Chance, The Paradise Riders, and some of the Lunars, was marked by a ceremony held on December 29, 2000 at the Hells Angels Clubhouse in Montreal. Overnight, this made the Hells Angels the biggest and most powerful one-percenter club in Ontario. This talk examines the circumstances that led to the Hells Angels becoming the dominating force in Ontario, the effects of the offer of a patch for a patch, and the reasons David Atwell betrayed his former brothers. This is the account of the most senior Hells Angel to ever defect from the organization and work as a government informant. Magnus has a history with motorcycles, however, before we get started, kindly like and subscribe. With the algorithms and all that, it really benefits the channel a lot. Let's start now. David Atwell was born in Scarborough, Ontario, and began working as a bouncer in Toronto in 1983 when he was just a teenager. A British immigrant and former Royal Marine served as Atwell's mentor when he first began working as a security guard. He characterized Jim, his tutor, as a fierce Falklands war veteran who showed him how to be a bodyguard. After joining the Hells Angels, he explained that his job at the new club was to clean tables, get drinks, and provide food for the full patches. He also said that the Ontario Hells Angels were second in importance to the long-running Quebec chapter, with some adopting a French accent to sound like the Quebec Angels. He expressed his concerns but was reassured that nothing would change other than the patches they wore on their backs. He would later come to regret saying in his book, I don't have what it takes to become a full-patched member of an established chapter of Hell's Angels, which is odd coming from a member who went on to become the sergeant-at-arms of his chapter, the highest position in a one-percenter club. He asserts that he lacked the predatory instinct and inherent criminality of those who can profit from situations like the Canadian fentanyl epidemic, claiming that they are fueling it. The massive patch over resulted in the addition of 14 Hells Angels chapters to Ontario, which previously had none. With the conversion of the two Paradise Rider chapters in Toronto, there are now six Hells Angels chapters in the city. Gerald Skinny Ward, who according to Atwell didn't even know how to ride a motorbike, was in charge of the new chapter in Niagara. On the other hand, the Niagara chapter virtually controlled all narcotics transactions on the Niagara Peninsula. Because of this, Walter Statnick decided to enable them to become members of the Hells Angels. This decision caused tension, requiring Walter Statnick to visit Toronto to resolve the dispute. Atwell described Statnick as cordial but very cagey and careful about what he said. Hells Angels members enjoyed a luxurious way of life. David claims that he received different treatment from everyone but quickly adapted to it. There was never any doubt that he would receive special treatment when entering any pub in Scarborough. He would never have to stand in queue, and before he even sat down, a comfortable seat and a cool beverage would be ready for him. His patch was like a credit card that he never had to pay back. Therefore, he never had to pay for anything. People treated me that way, and it was simple to adjust to. He claims that because there was no off switch, being a Hells Angel was unlike any other career. He lived for the club and was a Hells Angel all the time. He was always engaged in club-related activity, even when he wasn't with the group. Those who were close to him simply had to put up with his way of life. It was a commitment, not a job. The club becomes your life rather than merely taking over your life. He progressed through the Hells Angels ranks to reach the position of Sergeant at Arms, which is the top rank in a one percenter chapter. But soon after, after selling drugs to a woman who turned out to be a police informant, he was apprehended. 
Atwell claims that this is when he started to lose faith in the Hells Angels culture of general immorality and selfishness, saying, after the arrest, I began to see the club in an altogether different light. The guys were all in it for themselves. They weren't Hell's Angels because they liked to ride motorcycles and hang out together. Following his incarceration, he was forced to spend the following 20 months living on bond, during which time he accrued large legal obligations and had to move in with his father to save money. When a judge determined that the police had not properly gotten a warrant for the bug that captured him selling the drugs, the charges against him were eventually withdrawn. However, when it was discovered that he belonged to the Hell's Angels, he accrued a lot of debt and lost his position as a security guard. The other members of the club expected him to return to work for them after the charges against him were stayed, even though this had ruined his ability to work for anyone else. This means that the charges against him only resulted in a stay of proceedings, not an acquittal, meaning that there was a possibility that the charges could be brought back again. The restrictions the club had placed on his life made him feel confined. Though he knew it wouldn't be simple, he wanted to leave. He couldn't just quit and be an ex-Hells Angel whose name had been in every newspaper. Looking for a job would be tough because nobody would hire him for that because of his affiliation with the club. He says he was at a crossroads and had to make a decision that would change his life forever. David began acting as an informant for Project Developed after being approached by two cops from the Ops Anti-Biker Enforcement Unit. He began providing information to the police in 2005 and began receiving $1,850 a week in compensation from the government for a total of $450,000. David Atwell contends that he became an informant for moral rather than financial motives and that Jim, his Royal Marine mentor, only persuaded him to accept the money because he would require it to support himself while residing in witness protection. Atwell interviewed Mayor Dad Juicy Bauman, an Iranian immigrant who had fought in the Iran-Iraq War at the beginning of 2006. He was listening to Bauman talk about his assortment of submachine guns. His knowledge of firearms was so valuable to the Angels that they decided to waive their regular hearts-only rule and let him join. However, tensions were high among the Angels due to rumors that an informant was among their number. Donnie Peterson was on the prowl for the rat, which added to the stress in David Atwell's life. What made it worse was that Peterson and Douglas Miles, the vice president of the downtown Toronto chapter, were two of Atwell's closest friends. It was an awkward and uncomfortable situation since Atwell was secretly recording their conversations for the police. Peterson had even been the best man at Atwell's wedding, while Atwell had served as the master of ceremonies at Miles' wedding. He couldn't believe he had to betray his closest friends, but he was committed to his work as an informant. Atwell's task was made more challenging by the Project Tandem raids in September 2006, due to information provided by Stephen Galt, the Oshawa chapter's treasurer who had turned informant, several Hells Angels were apprehended. As a result, the club had a high level of paranoia, and Atwell's own paranoia was growing. He maintains he never had much respect for Galt, a man he detested, and that they were different from one another. Galt, he claimed, had turned informant in order to protect his own skin. He described Galt as a real hardcore criminal who had even bragged about killing people while he himself was just trying to get out of a life that had spun out of control. Atwell began abusing cocaine as a result of the stress, for which he received frequent reprimands from both his fellow angels and his police superiors. All of his meetings and conversations with Campbell regarding drug distribution were recorded. Due to information provided by Atwell, the authorities were able to stop many shipments of GHB, a substance used in date rape. As a result, Bauman became indebted to the tune of around $100,000, causing several other angels to step in to help him out. His brothers first began to think he was an informant in February 2007. Miles accused him of becoming an informant during a meeting in Atwell's garage, pointing out that he was purchasing considerably more drugs than necessary from far too many different sources. It embodies the typical actions of a police informant attempting to implicate his cohorts. Atwell's worst fears were realized when he asked why he had not been killed if he was a suspected informer, and Miles replied, that's why we're here right now. He was terrified, knowing that his fellow angels were planning to kill him. 
He didn't understand why Miles had spared him, but he noticed coldness in his fellow angels despite their superficial attempts to be friendly. Their smiles and jokes seemed forced. Knowing that Atwell was in danger and anticipating his imminent assassination, his handlers gave the order to place him under witness protection. The intelligence Atwell amassed helped the police win a major propaganda battle, which they used in conjunction with a number of raids on Hells Angels clubhouses across Ontario. Biker clubhouses have long been searched, according to biker expert Evis Levine, who was unimpressed with the Project Develop raids. As none have ever been discovered in a clubhouse in this province, they are aware that they should not keep any weapons, illegal substances, or incriminating evidence there. However, it's advantageous for the media and photographers. In April 2007, the police charged 31 Hells Angels with 169 criminal charges, plus seized drugs worth $3 million and property worth a half million dollars. Atwell served as the featured witness in the 2010 and 2011 trials. John Winner Neal, the head of the downtown Toronto chapter of the Hells Angels, was among the five members found guilty of selling GHB and cocaine as well as having illegal weapons in their hands. However, all of them were freed from the accusation of affiliation with a criminal organization. The trials were expected to be among the longest in Canadian legal history. Atwell declared during her testimony, I'm a rat. I have to be hiding for the rest of my life. Atwell had smashed up an automobile with a baseball bat to settle a business quarrel, according to Larry Pooler, one of the accused angels who represented himself in court. This damaged Atwell's reputation and gave the impression that he was a violent individual who had only become an informant for his own protection. The trial ended with Neil, Bauman, and Miles being convicted of trafficking in GHB, Campbell convicted of trafficking in cocaine, and Pooler convicted of the possession of an illegal weapon. Atwell admitted that being under witness protection was a mentally challenging situation, saying, It's a lonely life, traveling around and having no stability. What should I do? Getting close to someone is the only thing I can envision. If someone cares about someone, whether it's a friend, a platonic relationship, or an intimate one with the opposite sex, you can only go so far before that person who cares for you asks, well, what happened before that? What is your background? I can't share any of that with anyone. He said that he had no control over his life since his police handlers selected where he would live and work without letting him have any say in the matter. His life became one of constant worry and fear of being recognized. In a later book titled, The Hard Way Out, my life with the Hells Angels and why I turned against them. He talked about his time spent in the Hells Angels and what it's like for him to be a witness while living in witness protection. One of the sources for this video is the book. What do you guys think though? Please share your thoughts about David Atwell and what he did in the comments section below. And don't forget to like and subscribe to this video. You can also check out my other videos here on this channel to see if there are others you would find interesting. And I hope to see you in the next one.